I'm done reading An Unkindness of Ghosts by River Solomon. Going into An Unkindness of Ghosts, from the synopsis, from like what I heard from other people, and from just reading the back, I was kind of apprehensive about reading it because although it's sci-fi and a lot of people that I've heard about it from were like, this book is really good, it's, it's, it's enjoyable, but reading that it's a spaceship, but it's a spaceship set up like the Antebellum South and there's like slavery involved. I was kind of like, eh, I don't know why we're reading that because I'm not always one to gravitate to a slavery slave narrative. I do want to read more books like that, but at the same time, it's not like something that I'm like rushing to because it is something that I should read to get a better education on, better connection to, but at the same time, it's also something that's like most of the time i just like to enjoy myself when i read and all this sci-fi and it's taking you to a different world and other place it's still very much interacting with slavery and i was just kind of like mm, i'm not in the mood right now just not my my head space is not there my mind isn't there but i was like okay i'm gonna pick this up and i'm gonna read it i saw that jesse was reading it for blackathon 2.5 for Juneteenth, I already started reading. I got up to like the 99th page, maybe like a few pages after that, probably like 103. And I kind of stopped because I moved on to reading something else. And Jesse also had the same situation where they read it up to sit up to like page 70 and they needed to pick it back up so i was like okay let's buddy read it so it was kind of like an in and out buddy read for me because i was trying to keep up but also i was kind of like lollygagging too beyond that i did enjoy the characters i enjoyed aster she's a very well-developed character which i thought was so great about this book that's one thing i enjoyed about this book so much the mental health the disability the just sexuality and and identities, all of that that was like put into this book, it was done so effortlessly. It was done just so without like, I'm trying to like push that, you know, this book is diverse. It wasn't even trying to be that, partly because in this book, in this world, or at least in this setting, they don't really necessarily have the words, I think, for a lot of these, things they don't necessarily have it they're just kind of like it is what it is they exist you know like they're just existing in this world and they are expressing themselves the way that they naturally are and navigate a world that's not always that's not necessarily built for them i will say initially getting it like the first time i read the book when i started and i was going through it i was having issues with the writing and i do think the my issues with the writing came from the like how rivers solomon wrote this book because they wrote it in a manner that exemplified what the character was going through like basically you reading it you kind of get an idea of how this person thinks through how it's written uh, or at least that's how i interpret it reading from aster's perspective it read in a particular way that i was reading and i was like uh, i'm not fully grasping this but then when i read from characters like the surgeon or from a millicent or giselle like with the surgeon i felt a lot more comfortable reading from his perspective when i read from his perspective it felt like home it felt like something i was like okay i can I, I connect to this but then when i read from aster's perspective when i started reading from aster's perspective i was like Ooh, this feels good. Sometimes actions and reactions and stuff like that were a little cut off or move through quickly or, you know, sometimes like really getting into Aster's head and to what she's thinking. It, it, it was throwing me off a little bit. But the more I read, the more I got used to it. Because in getting used to it, I understood how Aster's mind worked and how Aster's mind was like navigating existing and i think that's the deep the depth of this book like you can read this the first time and get something from it and then read it again and you will get even more from it and i'm sure if i go back and read it again i would definitely see something new coming from it that i didn't get to before i did a live where i spoke with wendy of bookner tv and with erica of the broken spine and we discussed this book we had such a great time discussing it it was i had fun talking and i got so much more 
so many more different perspectives and a lot of confirmation from them about what I read in this book. It was fascinating and interesting to hear their perspectives on this book. A lot of what we said is that this book touched a lot, not just on slavery, but on a lot of stuff that we go through right now. There were people that were enforcing laws and were like keeping order and I guess peace or whatever. Basically, there were like police and like cops and 12 and pigs and all that. They were doing a lot of injustices that we see, that we've seen police do to black people. Like there was like publicly executing people. The public execution that happened in here it felt equivalent to what we've seen in real life where someone you're seeing somebody on camera in a video being killed by a police officer but in here you're seeing a black person being killed by someone who's enforcing a law and but it's done for public spectacle but for the most part i resonated with aunt millicent so much she was talking about like when she's working in the houses with like taking care of the people's kids and stuff like that and i guess like the wives the women of the house are like threatened by her or something, something like that and they think that their husbands are gonna be going after ann millicent ann millicent was like honey i don't want to be here your husband looks like boiled cabbage smeared with cream cheese if i could be in my room smoking a pipe by my lonesome i would be much happier but no I am here cleaning your infant's nasty, nasty spit up. Luring your husband away is the last thing on my mind. And I was just like, you know what, Amelson girl, you're right. I, I resonate with that so much. Like, sometimes you just want to be in your room like, bitch, y'all acting like I really want to be around y'all. Like, you really, like, the entitlement, the, the, the ego you got to think that I want to be around you. And I want to, you're meant get out of my face, get out of my face. Let me go in my room and be on my way, okay, bye. Another one that really resonated with me too what was Aster like thinking about her, I don't know, herself, like how she sees herself. Ordinary as she was, Aster knew much of being by herself, but as she lay in her cot shivering, she couldn't help but wish for a bed partner. And I resonated with that myself because I'm like as much as like you know sometimes you just want to be by yourself you also kind of want to be hugged up in bed with somebody like that special someone that one that you want to be with talking about Aster and Theo's relationship I loved their relationship as well as I loved Mabel and Pippi's relationship let's discuss M Mabel and Pippi's relationship real quick because it's brief i just loved how it was expressed in the book a lot of the affection the them touching each other and taking care of each other and holding each other and just being very affectionate and caring for each other i appreciated that so much they found each other and they're with each other and taking care of each other through all that they're going through all their own frailties i guess because that is something that astor said in the book too she and theo have known each other's weaknesses each other's frailties and mend it helps mend each other that is something that it's a little harder for me to grasp because I'm the type of person where I don't necessarily want to be it, I, I know it's important to be vulnerable with a significant other and another person and just other people in your lives but I think I've moved further away from being vulnerable like when I was younger it was like I was like a lot more vulnerable in this as I got older I'm just like you've had to harden yourself and protect yourself so much more so being vulnerable has not been where i'm at lately so i'm not fully resonating with like knowing each other's frailties because i'll be judging other people on their frailties i won't lie i'll be like uh i'll try to do my best not to show you my weaknesses but also like i don't want to know your weaknesses either that's none of my business and mind your business about mine okay thanks bye but i did resonate with that because i think that is why there is a longing and a need and a lonesomeness going on because vulnerability is important and that was something that i feel like aster needed to also do be a little bit more vulnerable as much as she liked theo there was a development in their relationship where she started to be more vulnerable with Theo, opening up to him, telling him how she felt. And he did that in kind with her and was like opening up and showing that, hey, I like you. I want to be with you. I will do anything for you. I will protect you. That is the thing I loved about their relationship because Aster is more of a masculine. She is an intersex person, but she's also a more masculine person. Theo is more of a femme presenting person 
person and they are attracted to each other and in love with each other and in this relationship with each other when for us our dynamics are usually a man is masculine and a woman is more feminine a man is usually more the big buff guy and a woman is more the slender slim person and now it's just like reading this book i saw it as them queering what it means to be a couple you know like it's averting your expectations of what uh how a woman is supposed to be in a relationship and how a man is supposed to be in a relationship and i feel like i've seen this in real life with other relationships where there is like a smaller slender skinnier more mild-mannered man with a woman who's more she's bigger more boisterous more bold more take charge she's the one who's gonna be out there fighting while he's just like in like he would be home taking care of the kids showing them love being caring he's the one that's more you know nurturing while his wife is the one who's more out there like being a protector and a, and you know that like i love that querying of the relationship of what it means to be in even just like a more heteronormative relationship it also made me think of this conversation that i've heard of before i don't know if i heard about it on the grapevine tv or if it was on one of the podcasts i've listened to but people have mentioned being black and blackness as being as a queer as being queer within itself because the societal norm is already to be white and cisgender this is what is seen as normal and to be black and just to not be white but mainly to be black is to be seen as like queer and to be different and to be other just so different this book kind of i felt like it tackled just being queer period like queer in your your presentation your sexuality your who you love how you how your body presents itself in just being black like we are like we're seen as different we're seen as as other and it's just I, I loved it. One more line that I felt resonated with me that was very much in line with Aunt Millicent was, Aunt Millicent was as bad as Aster, perhaps worse at knowing how to talk to people when they were hurting. People's unhappiness unnerved her. Annie was empathetic but emotionally incompetent. Aster had learned that well as a child. And I'm just kind of like, that is something that I felt about myself that I was not always like, good with other people's emotions i'm not even sure i'm good with my own goddamn emotions but you know i wasn't always good with other people's emotions so it was interesting to read about a character who isn't like it just you don't know how to handle other people's emotions and part of it is like for me at least i've had to kind of turn like felt like i was turning on a reaction to other people's emotions that would be acceptable to them you know in order to not feel like i was being like a total asshole or i'm being you know just uh, i don't know heartless or anything but it's just like i don't know how to handle this don't know how to deal with it don't know how to navigate or maneuver this i'm trying but at the same time it's like I, that's not me so there was also another character vivian it was so funny her character because Earlier in the book, Vivian was set up as like her only character trait was that she was a bitch and she just was like bitchy. That was her only character trait. And a few pages down in the book, Asta was like upset about something. Vivian said some bitchy shit because that's all she's good for. And Asta handled that ass. And after that, we didn't hear from Vivian any further because it's like, if you only have one character trait, you ain't got nothing else you ain't got nothing else to do to exist in this in this story any further be on your way like i thought vivian would have came back and she would have like gained more personality traits but she didn't so the story went all the way till the end and we never saw her from vivian ever again <laughs> although i've never read an octavia e butler book i do get a sense that rivers was inspired by octavia's writing because from what I've heard from Oct about Octavia E. Butler's books and their writing, I feel like Rivers is kind of on that same path, on that just like inspired by Octavia E. Butler. And I'm looking forward to reading more from River Solomon. I I'm I definitely looking forward to reading books by Octavia E. Butler and other black science fiction fantasy writers like N.K. Jemisin, The Legendary. This book is good. 
it gives you a lot of science fiction, a lot of technical science fiction stuff. I know in this book there are a lot of scientific space things going on in here that are real but then I guess there are like a few things that I'm assuming are made up for this world and for this book like selenium yes yeah, selenium right very interesting because I'm assuming it's like a combination of silver aluminum and on the subject of like a lot of the technical terms like space and all the technical terms and the made-up words as well this book has a huge vocabulary like going through this book like on a reread, I will definitely have to write down a lot of the words that I don't know and put and like look up their meanings and write that down because you will learn so many new words from this book. Like it's so much like words. Like if you don't know some of these words already, well, at least for me, I learned a lot of new words or at least I tried to learn a lot of new words from context, but there's a lot of new words in here that I could look up. One of the words I remember is a, what is it, a gantry or a gentry? I'm not sure. It's like supposed to be like a, like a kind of huge crane that like lifts up like those, what do you call those things again? Like those tractor trailer things that they import and export. So I learned a new thing, but there's so many more words that I didn't really focus on that I should, that like on a reread, I will definitely have to write them down and write down their meanings so that I can like really learn some new words, new vocabulary. River Solomon, you, your brain, your mind, so smart. Out here teaching the people just in one book, like amazing. I already see this book as a massive science fiction classic that deals with race and gender and sexuality like deals with all those kind of pop politics in one book i am glad i'm finally amongst those who have read it thank you for spending your time with me if there's anything that resonated with you definitely timestamp or leave a comment and i'm not this bitch like fleek the fuck